thought we'd do is just start by introducing ourselves. So we'll, we'll start and I'd like to hear who you all are and where you come from. Um, and this is really a, a conversation. So um, we'll do less presenting and more sort of interactivity with you all about your specific issues and, and uh, tap into the great resources we have here today. So I'm Heather Herford. I work at Google um, producing events. But actually, before coming to Google, I worked for 13 years at Wing TV which is a nationwide um, non-commercial television channel that launched in 1999. And I was fortunate enough to be part of the team to actually launched the channel, um, so built it from the ground up and did just about everything you can do at a television channel. And um, it was an amazing experience. So Google is a great connection for KMBT, but what I really love is that I can bring that sort of community media. And at Link, it was a, a nationwide community. Um, experience to the table too, um, especially nonprofit and, and small, which we were. So that's who I am. So I guess we're supposed to use these mics because of the video. I'm Mary Highland, and I've been involved in the nonprofit sector for, I hate to admit, but over 38 years. I don't say how much over 38 years. But, um, <laughs> I was uh, executive since CEO three, right? since I was three. Yeah, <laughs> um, executive CEO. My background was uh, at that time in mental health here in Santa Clara County. Um, but for the last 12 years, after leaving um, my organization, we had done a couple of mergers, so I have some experience in that area. I had a large organization with about 530 employees. But I really just felt called to do something different, and that ended up being working with executives and boards. Go figure. Um, but I have uh, pursued a, a doctorate in that area and completed it and did my research on the relationship between the executive director and the board chair. I really care about bringing um, evidence-based knowledge about boards, of which there's not very much, but to people so that you can get some real tools and, and practical advice about how to work together and how to have an effective board. I have seen, once I got out of my CEO hat area and, and have been out working with over 100 you know, of nonprofits in a variety of subsectors, I really see what an effective board can do and how powerful that is and what they can contribute. So I'm really passionate about helping nonprofits unleash the potential of that board and build a board that's really adding value because I know it can be there. But I know from my own experience in years as an executive, and I've been a board member too and a board chair, how so many boards in the sector struggle. And so that's I'm here to be a resource for you and um, try and see if we can make things better where they need to be better and take everything to the next level as far as boards are concerned. Hi, good morning. My name is Alyssa Burkett and I have a consultation practice in uh, philanthropy and development. Uh, I have been working in the nonprofit sector here in Silicon Valley for 17 years. And most of my work in my practice is with arts groups, uh, in education, also some leadership organizations and occasionally social services. Uh, and my practice focuses on macro level issues of management for nonprofits of all sizes. So things along the lines of strategic planning, capacity building, infrastructure and staffing, executive coaching, messaging, fundraising for sure, or development for sure. Uh, and you know, typically thought thought partnership with the executives leading these organizations. So the one thing that comes up, the common thread of all of my clients, all the time, is board relations, board management, and board development. Um, regardless of the size, this is an, a, an issue always. Because like fundraising, it's ongoing. You don't build a board and then check that off the list. It's an ongoing process of relations and management and making sure they're getting what they need so that you get what you need for your organization. So um, I'm also looking forward to the day, really eager to hear about where you all are from and what in particular you're concerned about and see how we can 
have a generative conversation to uh, look at these issues. about what works and we need to learn from each other. So that's, you know, I'll tell you briefly about my research in a couple of other areas, but, but what we know, and I didn't do this research, about boards is that effective boards, and I remember all the ways because there's lots of them, impact your organization in several ways. And this is, you can tell your board that they really matter. Because number one, organizations have better decision-making processes when they have a strong, effective board. They have better community engagement, which several of you talked about, uh, better stakeholder engagement, however you define that. I mean, one of the roles of the board is to say, who is our community? Who are we accountable to? Who do we need to engage? And that can be a very powerful conversation for your board to have. Um, one that I'm sure at least most of you, maybe not all of you, have to worry about is resources. I mean, you have a strong board, and I'm not necessarily saying every board has to be a fundraising board, but there are a lot of kinds of resources, one of which is social capital. And social what? capital is the asset you have by virtue of your <laughs> relationships. You, if you are an executive director, you can't have all the relationships your organization needs to have. Um, so boards really can help leverage in the area of relationships. And, you know, most importantly, we know that because boards, those that are strategic, think strategically, think about improving the community, have an impact on changing people's lives and making our communities better. So that's why boards matter. So it's worth it to invest in having a strong board and not, you know, just a lame duck board, and frankly, not just a fundraising board, but that's a very important part of board responsibility to make sure that you've got the resources you need. So when we talk about evidence, um, you know, that's why boards matter. Um, one of the things that, uh, I know quickly say it, one of the things that I found that I was frustrated by when I was out working with boards was people would say, come help me take my board to the next level. And I would say, great, love to help you do that come do a two-hour training at our board retreat. <laughs> you know, come, and get, you know, meet with me for an hour. You know, and so I wanted to find out how do boards get better? You know, it was very scientific. Get better. <laughs> Whatever get better meant for you, you know, for the executive, for the board. So I, I talked to 65 uh, board leader, board and executive leaders, about half and half. And I said, what got better? What's the critical success factors in the board improving? Um, and how did you do it? What was sort of the process? So the, the only thing, I mean, there's a lot more information around that, but I think it's important to share that one of the critical success factors, there were three, was the board chair. Because, which was really interesting because of my prior research, that if, and I think somebody said this in the room, my board chair does not believe in strategic planning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what happens is if your board chair, what I found is, you know, the executive alone cannot move the board. That if the board chair says, we don't need that, what the heck are you talking about? 
you know, what, we're, we're great, we're, we're a good board, you know, we're, so forget it, you know, you just gotta wait till the next person comes in. Um, the second critical success factor was intention, which really fits with that. You know, the board, there was at least a critical mass that said, we need to get better, we intend to improve. And the, and the third thing was what I call a nudge, which is like your board members come to a training, or your board members learn from an outside, usually an outside source, that there, they could be better, that there could be something. So it's a like awareness. So anyway, I don't know if that answered your question. There's not a lot, there's a lot more, maybe Alyssa can answer to this. Um, based on my look, there's a lot more research in the area of philanthropy um, than there is on board functioning and the executive board relationship. When I did mine, there wasn't one study one study, and I would call Dick Shade from Harvard, who wrote the book Governance as Leadership, which I highly recommend, by the way. It's been around a long time, but it's really good. Um, on the board executive relationship and what could be more critical to the functioning of the organization. So academics, I guess, just don't, you know, they, they study things that are, they're funded to study, but anyway, I'm going to at least, so, it's tough to find meaningful uh, research out there for boards. So I'll probably do more when I can get the bandwidth. No, I would agree with all of those points about what, what makes a good board. I think that those are all critical. And I would also say that um, one of the things that uh, makes a good board is helping your agency or your organization get on the radar. You know, And this is to the point that the executive director, no matter how great he or she is, can't carry the whole load. And especially in this age that we're living in, the network is everything, right? Who you know is everything, the relationships are everything. And your board, if you have a strong, cohesive, thoughtful, intentional board, whether they're a working board or not, they can help get your mission on the radar in the places it needs to be, whether it's for funding or for governmental help or, or just public awareness. Your board helps you do that. That's a solid, high-functioning board can help advance your, your mission. Actually, that's the one I forgot. That it, there's evidence to prove that. Reputation and credibility. For me, it's all about the concept of collective leadership, right? It's that I, I think a trap that a lot of organizations fall into, whether they're a small organization or they inherited a board or they just kind of cobbled together a group of warm bodies without thinking too much about it, um, it's this shifting your thinking that it's it's collective leadership, that, that it's not an adversarial dynamic, it's not staff against the board where you're always in a defensive position at your board meetings or always having to justify the decisions you make as the executive director, or on the board side, always feel like you're <coughs> being asked to do something uncomfortable or painful or that you're ill-informed about or something like that. You have to create a dynamic that is truly about shared mission and collective responsibility and collective reward, you know? That if, if, you're, if you're a board member, you're a volunteer, I mean, this is, matters, you know, that it, it shouldn't be excruciating to be on this board because you're a volunteer. And so the ED and the staff need to remember that. And if you're a board member, you have to remember that this is a lot of work that the staff is doing and they need your support. They need you to be thinking about this between meetings. They need you to be offering um, support more often than criticism. I mean, it's okay to be a skeptic and poke holes and conversations if it's generative and helpful, but it's not helpful if, you're, if your ED constantly feels like you're questioning every move he or she makes. That's, that's not actually helpful. So to me, it's, and what we did, Suzanne, with your group, is, is to have these conversations that shifted it to where the board was really owning the conversation. It wasn't Suzanne going, y'all need to fundraise. <laughs> it was the board going, oh, we need to fundraise more. <laughs> to make this math work and to make to forward this agenda, we actually need to be doing this. And so our work was to shift the conversation so they came up with that on their own and they felt great about it. They were and they crafted the plan. 
And they all bought in, and they all sort of worked on each other, saying, do you commit to this? Do you agree to this? Do you think this is worthwhile? And they all kind of came in. There was some self-selection, quite frankly, of people who worked, and they gracefully exited the organization, which was needed. Um, but the people who stayed and the people who came on after that, man, it was really clear what the game was. And everybody got it and supported it, and there was no pushback. So my work with them was four months or three months. Three months. So my, my work, direct work with them was pretty short, frankly. But their work continued past that, you know, and they, you know, had some kind of, we had some crucial meetings, right, where they, light bulbs went on, and then they did a lot of conversation <laughs> in between those meetings, you know, and there was leadership <laughs> that emerged, and um, they've got good leaders on there who are very thoughtful and, and mindful about what they're trying to accomplish, and they would have the individual conversations, and I think there was a key meeting, it was a board meeting where they had to have a vote on a new policy that really was, a, a big departure for what they had done before, and they had to tee up that vote, you know, and they did, and they did it well. They did it elegantly and, and, and very constructively, and I don't think anybody felt pummeled by it. I think they were all on board. So the whole thing, my work was relatively short, but it went past my contract work with them, and it's still going on, frankly. I mean, it's a conversation that has to continue. Yeah, I thought I could offer just some anecdotal evidence um, from my experience with KMBT, which when I came in about seven months ago, was going through a very intentional reformation of their board. Um, and shortly after joining, we actually had a, a board retreat, which did a lot of what you've been talking about, Alyssa, where we, where we as a board talked about what we wanted to accomplish, and we sort of came up with you know, the things that we thought we could do to impact KMBT and to help. Um, and we came up with very specific committees and we divided into groups and decided who was going to be on what committee and, and also what we were going to be accountable for. It's great to go to a committee meeting, but if nothing comes out of it, every month was the point. And so um, we got really clear about what you know what that what accountability was going to mean from each of those groups. And we had to focus, you know. There was sort of a kind of started with a lot of brainstorming, a lot of ideas, but at the end of the day, you know, we have to pick one or two things to do really well and not try and do everything and then have nothing be accomplished. So that was a big part of it too, is just everybody sort of getting on board about what those couple of priorities were gonna be. And and that this is where Shelly was great, was you know, she kinda had to um, do a reality check a couple times, like what you guys are saying is really awesome, but that's not what our station needs, you know, and so she would keep us on track um, as we went without shutting people down. Um, it was a really great weekend. Um, and I came out of it understanding, you know, what I needed to do when I showed up for board meetings every month and to my community meetings mm -hmm. um, beforehand. So um, we're only, you know, a few months past that. So we're just starting to see what the impact is, but I thought it was incredibly useful. We had somebody from the outside come in and, and just moderate that. I think you raise a really good point which is about on the accountability. And I think the single best thing you can do to build a, a, an effective board, a high performance board, is be really explicit in your expectations. You know, when you're building a team on your staff, you, you have a job description, you have performance reviews, <laughs> you talk openly about what you expect them to do in this job and how they'll be evaluated and what happens when those expectations aren't met. But that's, I think that's the single best thing you can do for your board members. It's a favor you're doing for your board members to be really explicit about what you expect. If you expect that strategic planning is a core part of their responsibility, that needs to be spelled out. If you expect them to donate $1,000 minimum every year, that needs to be spelled out. If you expect them to be actively a part of your fundraising program, that needs to be spelled out. If they need to attend meetings, <laughs> you need to spell that out. If they need to attend things other than meetings, you need to say that. I mean, it's, it's a courtesy to your board to be really explicit about that. And then everybody's clear on what the game is. And, you know, there's no surprises and there's no kind of, um, I don't know why he doesn't give any money. 
anybody else gives money? Well, did you tell him he needs to give money? <laughs> you know, it's that kind of thing. It sounds obvious, but you'd be surprised. A lot of organizations don't do that. Well, and I think going back to your sorry, Mary, no, that's one little thing. Um, your point about it shouldn't be a painful experience. Exactly. Um, I actually had a, a colleague of mine who's on a board. She posted something about you know I'm at the board meeting and they're talking about you know what color the tablecloth should be. Oh my God, you know, shoot me now. And I have to say, <laughs> our meetings are not like that at all. Our meetings are really clear. Like we have an agenda. It's really it's really um, a great use of my time. You know, I feel really good about showing up and. and um, being a volunteer for this organization because they respect my time and they, you know, it's not it's not a waste at all. Um, and I feel like I can, um, you know, have an impact. So when people come to me and say, I want to move my board from here to here, which is, the, you know, what are the tips to really get started with that? Um, there's, I mean, certainly I agree with everyone. The first thing that I usually ask about is it's about your why your important why. Um, why are people on the board? Why do they even care? And that gets to your strategic vision, what I call your strategic vision. I mean, whether you have a plan or you don't have a plan, it's like, if you're gonna be really successful, this is an important question. I mean, boards are all about asking the right questions. So how you create some questions that can get your board to think a little differently about where it is and how it's contributing, one of the key questions is if you're really successful of advancing your mission, you know, what's it going to look like in three years? <coughs> and I don't think you, most nonprofits are going out beyond three years these days, but not one year, that's too close. But to get people um, engaged with a compelling result that they can get excited about. So if you don't have that, you need that, because that's the heart. You know, your board members. Do not join your board because they're passionate about governance, folks. You know, they're passionate about something else. And so that gets me to the second piece, which is relationships. You know, the challenge for you as an executive is you've got to have a relationship with every person on that board. And everybody on that board needs a relationship with each other. And so what I see people doing in boards is they work on the work of the organization whether they're hands-on or they're strategic, they're working on the work of the organization. They do not make enough time to work on the work of their relationships with each other. Building the board as a team. Coming to meetings because they want to see somebody. Coming to meetings, you know, to have a point because they're going to talk about something meaningful. So I think we really have to remember to get down to the point that people are volunteering because of what's in their hearts. And you need to connect with that and engage that. And if you've got a board chair that's toxic, you know, if you've got to talk about what do we need. The common thing all those board members have, hopefully, is they care about whatever that why is. And that's where you have common ground and, and maybe you just have to do some baby steps to start there with the relationships and good questions. And you know, what kind of board do we need to be for this organization? What does this organization and our community deserve from us? And help, you know, I think the accountability thing, I think your board, you know, just want to add on that. What I see when I go in and work with people saying a board retreat, you know, I got one day, and the board says, oh, you know, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And over and over again, I see boards um, that before I, I was in the room, walk out of the room with all these goals and things they're going to do, and then nothing happens. So the accountability thing is really important. Create account an accountability process. At the board needs to say, if somebody doesn't do something, how are we going to hold each other accountable? And figure out what you're going to do before <coughs> it's personal, guys. Before it's about the person who doesn't show up, which actually the law requires if you don't know if your board doesn't know the three legal duties of their own personal board member responsibility, they need to know it. And one of them is they got to show up. So anyway, I went and touched a lot. But that accountability process is really important. It's pretty simple. But it's you create that team by having these conversations. You know, to Alyssa's point, make it explicit. Don't take it for granted that people know what's going to happen if they don't do what they say they're going to do. 
And when you agree as a team together what that's going to be, then implementing it doesn't become so personal. And it's easier for you as an executive because the board is owning managing itself, not expecting you to manage it or not expecting you to be the one that's delivering the messages. And you're not dumping it all on the board chair either. You know, the board chair doesn't have to be the default governance police person. You know, they help with that. They have some responsibility, but it can be shared leadership tools. Anyway. One thing I have to know, just a little thing about our, we call it a board forward and not a retreat. And there's so much in, you know, uh, in the words yeah. you use. <laughs> <laughs> board advance, I might steal that. that. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, going forward. Right. You know, right. Um, it was yeah. cool. It actually yeah. did make it, that one word made a big difference on how we all went into that weekend. That shared leadership. <coughs> shared leadership. <coughs> well, do you use consent calendars? That's the best practice. Yes. Consent yeah. calendar. Pretty much we do. Some of it is. Yeah. For those of you, a, a consent calendar is where you put reports that need to be read and deliberated around, um, but Maybe you don't have questions, you don't have to debate, you don't, you know, guys, everybody can read. Yeah. You put those out ahead of time. Right. Um, to my point again about the legal thing, duty of care says you're supposed to come to board meetings prepared. And so if you put that out ahead of time, there's a responsibility for people to read that. If they know it's the law, it gives a little leverage instead of just saying you should. Um, and then the consent calendar has everything on it that can just be all voted at once. You know, government does this all the time. And, but if a board member has a question uh, or something and wants to pull that off, at the very beginning, the board chair says, okay, is there anybody who wants to pull anything off the consent calendar? So you're getting through, you know, a ton of that. We're just reporting to each other. That's not really quality at your meeting. I agree with that. I also, I love the idea of carving out a chunk of time on the agenda to wrestle with a particular question. Mm -hmm. I mean, board members want to add value. Board members want to be in service to the organization. And one of the best ways they can do that is, is um, offer thoughts or advice or insight or just ask questions or, or contribute to the conversation. And so if there's something real on the table that you need to work through, and it doesn't need to be a crisis issue. It can just be, a, you know, a strategic question or something you're considering or, or something that that everybody's thoughts on would be helpful. I think that's a really useful, um, a, a good use of time at a board meeting. Um, also, I've seen a lot of boards try to incorporate fellowship into board meetings lately. Afterwards, mm -hmm. that's building the team and it's social glue. So this is this is hard when. You know, we have so little time and we have so much to get done, I can't really work on my board bonding with each other. But to Mary's point, it, it matters and it's more meaningful to them if they feel connected to the person sitting next to them at these meetings. And so I, I've seen a lot of organizations build in time for fellowship either in the evenings or around lunch or something like that and, and it's useful. You know, it, this brings up something else for me in terms of when you're thinking about recruiting board members to what Alyssa said about expectations. You know, if you go at this with a scarcity mentality, you're going to get a scarcity result. I mean, I just believe that. If you go at it saying there aren't enough people out there, there's nobody out there that will help us raise money, for sure. Um, there's Everybody out there is so busy, they have no time for us. They can't attend board meetings. We better not ask them to do anything except that. Maybe they can just call in. You begin to whittle down and make smaller and smaller and smaller your expectations. You deserve more. You can get more. You need to ask for it. People, I've seen it over and over again. People will step up when the bar's high. They want to be part of a board that's effective and successful. They don't want to be part of a board that you're apologizing for. 
So really, do not do that. If you really have, if your board has a scarcity mentality, you've got to shift that. There's people out there. You've got to believe that, that there's an abundant world out there. People care about what you do, folks. You've got to do some work to find them. But they're there, and don't settle for less. And don't make your board members less than because you're diminishing what that board is supposed to do and making it easy to not be engaged and not contribute. Um, so ask for more than you think you can get. Really great points. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of cool how I ended up on KMPT's board because it wasn't a direct hit. It wasn't like Shelly knew somebody who knew me, you know, and like, oh, you know, she's the right one. Shelly started talking to people at Google, and then the person she talked to talked to, you know, somebody else, and then they, you know, and it took a while before it got to me, and it was because the people along the way recognized that it needs to be the right fit. We don't want to just plug somebody in to this organization. We want to plug the right person in, and so. And it eventually got to somebody who said, oh my gosh, well, Heather used to work at LeTV, and she, you know, maybe she'd be interested. So that connection took time to make, and it, and it is a great fit, and I, I feel really great you know, being a part of it. Um, a couple more things I want to say. One is that it's really great for me that Shelly's very specific about what she needs from me. She comes with really direct asks, like Google has a, a, a grant program for community organizations, and that was one of the first things I was able to work on with her. She was very specific, this is what I need from you, can you do it? Yes, I can, and we did it, and we got the grant, and it was awesome. Um, and, and I'm a single parent, I, you know, I can't give a lot of money to KMBT, but I hope it was $15,000, you know, because it was a very direct initiative that we went after. Um, I think the other thing I want to echo is um, something that we sort of live by at Google, which is moonshot thinking, the idea that, you know, if you shoot for something that feels totally impossible, you're probably not going to accomplish it, but you're going to accomplish something pretty great um, because you set you know your goal out that far whereas if you always set these sort of incremental like oh here's something I know we can do you have no idea the opportunity lost by not sort of stretching your goals and pushing yourself beyond um, what feels doable so um, it really is like I mean pretty much every company wide being we have a Google that gets brought up in one way or another um, so it's, it's a great way to run an organization and keep people really excited You know, you don't don't spend your time thinking of all the reasons that it won't work, or or thinking of why they're going to say no. Yeah. You know, there's an expression in fundraising which is, "Don't say no for somebody else. <laughs> Ask them <laughs> if they want to say no. They can say no, but don't say no for them before you even have the conversation." And the same goes for board recruitment. I've been in recruitment meetings where people are like, oh, he'll never do it. He's too busy. It's like you know, you don't know that if you have a good contact. Ask him, have the conversation, and he may say no. And also, don't assume people are too busy. Busy people are the greatest people to have on your board. Busy people know how to get stuff done. <laughs> well, and, and even if you go to someone and they say no, they may have the right person. Yes. Absolutely. Right. Yes. That's what happened in my yes. case. I have thoughts on that. Um, so, do you all know what, she, do you, do you know what she's referring to? So, this is a tool for board recruitment where you set up a matrix and there's, they're readily available online or you can create your own. And what you're doing is you're just creating a dashboard of what you've got currently and where the holes are. And so that drives your recruitment efforts. It's like if you set up the matrix and you, you divide it in between attributes, um, competencies, and one other thing skills. skills. So then, so it's like gender, ethnicity, geography, age, board experience, and then what sector they represent, what, um, uh, you know, what, marketing, legal, finance, this and that, and then the bottom one is their, their competencies, so like they're a strategic planner, or they um, really know about community access, or whatever, that, that like goes beyond their day job, right? Mm -hmm. So you set up this matrix, and you plug in all the <coughs> that you currently have, and then you see where the holes are. And so, my thoughts on this are, it's a great tool to get a snapshot, to go, oh, 90% of our people are heads of other nonprofits. Hmm, 
maybe we should branch out into corporate or something like that. Or 90% are white males in their 70s or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it really, it's very, it gives people a very quick visual on yeah. where you're at. The flip side of that is I've seen people get really hung up on the process of using the matrix to where they never actually talk to anybody. Yeah. You know, yes, that, I do know. Like, using the matrix gets dragged out over weeks and months and go, well, we really need to figure out it to where you're, you're not implementing, you're not you know, talking to anybody about seeing if they might be interested in being on your board. So I think it's a good tool if you use it as a tool and then move on it. That's my opinion. Okay, yeah, I agree it, it can be a good tool. Um, I agree with everything Alyssa said. I think that the attribute part is really critical. What are the characteristics you want from this person? You know, you want competencies, you want character. You need to know how do you figure out if somebody's a leader? These are the soft things that you need on your board that are hard to put in a matrix. And when I hear matrix, I freak out usually because it's usually <laughs> the kind of easy stuff, you know, the ethnicity, the geography, all this stuff. So the hard stuff is what kind of person do we need? Or how do we know if they're a strategic thinker? How do we know if they're a leader? So that's one thing. The other thing, though, is I think that your strategic vision, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Your strategic vision has to drive what do you need? What kind of board do we need to be? And what are the skills we need? So you can be explicit when you're recruiting. So that's really important. The other thing is that I've uh, worked with a couple of boards where they go much deeper in that profile. And this can be touchy. You have to see if people are willing to do it. But they actually ask people for their affiliations. You know, one of the things you need is spheres of influence. Mm -hmm. You want to touch different spheres of influence. This is another perspective on diversity. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you've got somebody who's in a particular profession, you know, there's a sphere of influence there, but you know, you're not getting out of that. If you've got too many finance people, for example, you're touching sphere, you know, finance. Well, what about medical? What about health? What about education? You know, there's all kinds of them. So I, I on one board that I was working with. They went in and just sent affiliations, and they even asked for religious affiliations. And they said, "This is voluntary. You don't have to say if you don't yeah. want to." But where where people graduated from college, you know, what what memberships do they have? Oh my God! It created a whole different awareness of who the people on that board were. And it doesn't mean everybody's volunteering up that they're going to go, you know, evangelize to every single person in their associations, but. So it, it, I really just encourage you to go deeper, but I also encourage you to be very specific strategically about what you want and the, the characteristics of the people and do that hard. Yeah. You know, when I was the CEO, we after our couple of mergers, we redesigned our process and we had five steps in that process, including everybody getting together for a social event where people could just get to know each other before the person was even invited to a board meeting. So going from, you know, meeting with the executive director and board chair to the board meeting, we had a couple of steps in between uh, that even. and. Um, it really worked because by the time somebody went through it, um, they were already, people felt they already knew them, they come into the board meeting, they're ready to hit the ground running. They're not sitting there looking around saying, well, I don't know any of the people in the room, yeah. I'm gonna be quiet for the next three meetings. I mean, you're not getting any value out of that person for a whole year. One other point on the using the matrix strategically <clears throat> is I like Mary's point about going a little bit deeper on attributes and competencies because one of the hangups that I've seen is when people say, oh, well, they're in marketing, that's great. They can come on the board and do our marketing for us, <laughs> which is not how to use the tool. It's really not. I mean, somebody who does marketing all day, just, they don't want to do a second job for you. And this especially comes up with event planners every time. It's like, great, we can get an event planner on the board and they can do all our events. And I guarantee you an event planner does not want to do all your events for free. 
So the, the <laughs> other caveat is that if you use a tool like that, really use it thoughtfully and strategically to go a little bit deeper on the, the basics. And ask people if they're willing to do what you need for them to do. That's what that, I, I don't believe in for job descriptions, but I do believe in job announcements. And that's what I would say about the board members. You're saying these are, we are, this is who we are. This is what we have decided we need. And if you are interested and meet those criteria and are willing to fulfill these expectations, that's the job expectations part. Um, that's where, where you get that, but you gotta, you gotta ask people, are you willing to do this? Uh, the other thing is skills. You know, um, just one more comment on that, that I found that people, when you think finance, you think, you know, CPA, banker, whatever. You know, go, again, go deeper on that. What kind of skill are you looking for? Maybe a small business owner has that skill. You know, sometimes when we're recruiting, we have these narrow perspectives about this is the only place I can go to get the skill set. Right. Not necessarily. So think about the function you need that person to fulfill versus the profession you think they need to have. Not the same thing. I think you just answered it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you are you happy with it? Is it working? Is it? Yeah. If you don't have a lack, you know, then you don't need to hire somebody. What happens with the consultant is a lot of times organizations, um, either the board chair or the or the ED, thinks they're saying the same thing over and over again. And when an outside person comes in and says the exact same thing, the board goes, Oh. <laughs> and and it's just a matter of that's just how it works. You know, that's how human beings work, right? And so. Um, sometimes that's what's helpful to bring in an outside facilitator. But if you're able to get that work done without it, then great. I think one thing is to think about what what it is that would have value for you. Um, so I have two thoughts about this, both for strategic planning process, but mostly for board retreats, because what I see there um, is first start with purpose. Be really clear the result you want from your process. So you know there's sort of this triangle purpose process. People is so what's our purpose? What's the result we want? Who? Who cares about this? Who should be involved in this process? So that you're purposefully designing your process. You don't have to have an outside person help you with that. You might bring somebody in just to coach you around that. You know, I do a lot of board coaching. I don't have to come in necessarily and facilitate the whole thing, but you know, they just touch base with me about is this a good process to use to get what we want? Or more often, They've got this process, the activities, all these things they're going to do, but they haven't even thought about the purpose. You know, and, and for board retreats, what do you want to walk away from that day with? Not, oh, these are the activities we're going to do. Don't start there. Start with purpose. So, you know, I think think about what would be helpful, and if, if you need some expertise to help you design a good process, that's a different kind of engagement than, um, that might be two hours, which is a lot cheaper than, you know, couple thousand dollars to come in and do the whole thing if you can do it so you know I'm all for uh, do do what you can I think if you have any sensitive issues having someone in your own um, group facilitate means they're kind of out of the conversation so that's something that you kind of lose out on because when you're facilitating you're not participating but you know do what works for you I wanted to go back to the board relationships point just for a second and say we um, haven't really done it yet, but we're attempting to mix up our board meetings so that they're not always, you know, in the same venue in the same format. So we we're, we're going to go out to dinner. You know, some months we'll, we'll just have a meeting over dinner, and all the board members will pay for their own dinner. So there's you know nothing weird there, but um, or we'll do a Google Hangout um, so that people don't necessarily have to make the trip every time. 
um, you know, to come on site. So just mixing it up, I think, creates different conversations and also um, allows for those moments of you know kind of getting to know each other better and building the relationships between board members when when you mix it up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I would challenge you to have your board members sit down and write down three things they know about each other that it's personal. Mm -hmm. You know, what are three things you know about each other that's personal? You know, Mary, who's your husband? Who's your wife? How many kids do you have? Go to school? Blah, blah. So we're coming up on 11 o'clock. I don't know. Um, we started a little late, so if folks want to go over, that's fine. I just don't know. Because we'll have other things to do. <coughs> I think lunch starts at 11.30, so we have a little bit of a break. I think it's a break between the session and lunch. So you go check out. <laughs> check out of your rooms. Yes, yes. Yeah. I think that was one of the interesting things that came out of our sort of one one exercise, one you know outcome was to get a really clear mission, and it was interesting to see how people differed on what they thought the organization really stood for, and to get everybody kind of on the same page, you know, um, was really yeah, it was really good. Uh, I don't think it's necessary to do that, and I think it's a time suck for your staff. I think it's good at board retreats because everybody gets shared buy-in. Um, I think at board meetings, your regular board meetings, if there's somebody who has regular interface with your board, like development director or um, somebody who needs access to the board or who has a role in presenting their piece, then they should be there. But full staff, I don't. I would not our, our committees are the place where that interaction happens between board members and, and staff. So those are separate meetings that happen <coughs> around just pick like three areas. We have um, development, which is basically fundraising and diversifying revenue streams, new media, and then uh, education. So um, that's where that happens. I just want to be really explicit that the executive director needs to be there. You know, um, oh yeah, that's that's really important. I just you know, I thought, well, yeah. let's not lump ever all the staff together. Um, I agree with everything's been said. I do think um, it can be helpful occasionally to invite staff in to talk about what their role is. You know, make that presentation, make that mission moment connection, because staff members don't understand sometimes what they don't even get it. You know, what's the role of the board? Um, that you know, you're all remote people that they never meet. So I think there is an opportunity, but in particularly on committees, but usually that's higher level staff. So if you have others, sometimes it's nice just to give them a chance to speak and answer some questions. But yeah, I agree. It's a, it, you know, you don't have. Well, maybe you do. Raise your hand if you have unlimited capacity. <laughs> okay, you don't have unlimited capacity, so one of the things you have to do is you have to deploy your capacity, both your board capacity and your staff capacity, very strategically. So, you know, even for board retreats, people say, well, should the staff be the I said, it depends. What's your purpose? What's the outcome you want? Are they key stakeholders that need to participate in creating that outcome? If not, you know, I'm, I'm not being saying, you know, exclude, it's about capacity. Sure, if it's creating problems in your personal life, I'd say that's, that would be an indicator that you're too deeply invested. <laughs> I, I think it's about, go ahead. Or it's creating organizational problems. Yeah. yeah. I think it's about perspective. If you're over invested in the sense that you can't, you have so much ownership that you're threatened by other people's views, you aren't open to other people, sh you know, to that shared leadership thing. Are you able to share leadership? Are you able to be inclusive? Are you able to hear other voices? So I think when you say over invested, it's really about what does that really mean? You know, willing, being passionate, really caring, putting lots of hours in. 
that can be wonderful. I mean, that can be an unusual gift, but if you're, I think I said enough about that ownership thing, control issue. One last thing I'll say, and we're, we're getting ready to close. I, um, you know, someone mentioned the issue of having a toxic personality on your board. I, I will say that it's true. One person can change and shift the dynamic of your board for the negative, but also for the positive. So as you're building a board, keep that in mind too. Is that it's not just about keeping out the negative, but find find the person with the skill set and the competencies and the passion for the product and the understanding of the mission who can help you shift the dynamic on your board because one person can do that and you'll see a, a, a higher performing board after that. I just yes. want to say thank you. I was sitting in the back because I was sure I was going to walk out. Oh. <laughs> well, thank, thank you all for being you all. such active. We'll actually be continuing the conversation this afternoon in the Monterey room starting at 145. Thank you. Thank you.